Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Middle East uh, Institute for a very special occasion. And I do mean special because our, our guest is uh, unusually, unusually uh, distinguished and accomplished. Uh, as most of you know, the, the Institute has a series of lectures, panel discussions, conferences, film programs, outreach to schools, and so on and so on. Um, one of the things, though, that we also do is select usually three outstanding scholars or public figures to come to Singapore every year uh, as in our, what we call our prominent speakers series. Uh, these are exceptionally uh, talented and accomplished individuals. The first uh, lecture in this prominent speaker series uh, was given by our colleague uh, Ali Alawi, uh, who uh, has just departed for Baghdad, but was kind enough to participate in our breaking news uh, dialogue session yesterday on the situation in Iraq. Um, and sometime, um, we think next uh, late summer or fall, the third speaker in the series, who is uh, Dr. Hanan Ashrawi from Palestine. Uh, she, will, she will be coming here. But today, I have the uh, distinct honor and privilege to introduce uh, Saladin Ibrahim. Uh, we go back a long way. I, I can't quite remember how long. Uh, uh, we have uh, met many a time of professional meetings in the United States and the Middle East, going back, uh, I should think, at least till the 1970s. And, um, and then, of course, in Egypt. And I remember uh, on one occasion being uh, with Saad and uh, his, his wife, Barbara, at the pyramids. I'm not quite sure what we were doing, but it was fun. And then there was another occasion, uh, which turned out not to be so much fun, but uh, Saad and Barbara had invited me for dinner at one of these Nile restaurants, with these boats that are sort of tied up on the Nile. We had a lovely dinner one night. Uh, I got on the plane, I was flying back to Washington the next day, but when I got back to Washington, I turned on the television and learned that Saad had been arrested. Uh, he had been seized, I guess, just hours after we finished this nice dinner. And I hope he won't hold me responsible <laughs> for that, because uh, his, uh, his ordeal in prison was, was not pleasant, as I think probably many of you know. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim is a professor of political sociology at the American University of Cairo. Uh, he is this will take much too long. I think you probably want to hear from him directly, but I, I have to tell you a few things that he, he, he does. He's the Secretary General for the Egyptian Independent Commission for Electoral Review. He's the President of Cairo's Union of Social Professions. He's a trustee of the Arab Thought Forum in Amman. He's a member of the Club of Rome, Chairman of the Board of the Ibn Khaldun Center for Development Studies in Cairo a member of the World Bank's Advisory Council for Environmentally Sustainable Development, member of the Board of Minority Rights Groups in London, the Middle East International Forum, Transparency International's Council on Governance, International Bureau for Children's Rights Board of Directors, and chairman of the Board of the Egyptian Enlightenment Association. Uh, he has done many things. He has authored uh, any number of books and important studies, uh, one of which, um, if I remember correctly, was based on interviews uh, with prisoners in uh, uh, Egyptian prisons. Mm -hmm. That was before you actually decided to do field research of your own in a different prison. Um, he, his books include Sociology of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, Kissinger and the Middle East Conflict. I don't think I want to read that one. Um, uh, Arabism in Egypt, the new, uh, the new Arab Social Order, which is a book that we used uh, in our classes at Georgetown, I remember. Um, 
and many, many others. Um, we knew him, uh, I knew him in particular, in particular admired his work because he was a pioneer in the study and indeed the development of civil society organizations in Egypt and in the Arab world. And um, in setting up the Ibn Khaldun Foundation and then publishing their magazine uh, called Civil Society, uh, he was uh, definitely a trailblazer in, um, in focusing, I think, scholarly attention on, on a neglected area, which indeed is the area of civil society, and the question of uh, organizations uh, uh, in civil uh, society. Uh, that, was, that was very important work. Uh, his PhD uh, is from the University of Washington in Seattle, and his bachelor's degree of uh, honors was from the Cairo University. Uh, many awards, uh, too many really to mention, from, from Germany, from London, from New York, Freedom House, Middle East Studies, Association, Kuwait, Jordan, Bahrain, and so on and so on. As you can see, uh, our our speaker is indeed uh, prominent, and uh, we're especially happy to have him here uh, for two lectures. Uh, this afternoon's lecture on uh, uh, the future of uh, Egypt and its relations with the region, and tomorrow we are co-sponsoring uh, with the Islamic Association in Singapore, MUIS, at, at the MUIS Academy headquarters. Uh, uh, a, a lecture dealing with uh, the question of genocide uh, uh, in Islam. So uh, without further ado, I'm very happy uh, to welcome you to Singapore and to uh, NEI. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for such an undeserved introduction. Some of the things you mentioned are completely blurred in my mind. I don't even remember that I did them, but I assume that you are more accurate than I am. Uh, I am only intrigued by one part of your introduction, is that the last supper we had was the night before my arrest. So I wrote this Sorry. time. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you are no witness. If anything happened to me, then you know. <laughs> that this very old and dear friend of mine has also could be <laughs> occasionally bad news. <laughs> I, uh, I chose, uh, my wife chose for me the title of this talk, Egypt Renews Our Spring. And I was telling uh, Michael earlier today uh, that my wife, Martha, uh, was in the square when, actually even a few minutes before the crowd arrived to start what now we call the Egyptian Revolution, which was one month after Tunisia. And we have another Tunisian connection here, or oh, from your mind. Actually, half of this audience are people that I've run into, time to another. So I'm also happy for reconnecting with some old friends. Uh, here are the three or four things I want to say about Egypt's renewal of the Arab spirit. And let me start with something that happened nearly a week on uh, Sunday, June 8th. It was a moment or a day that contemporary Egyptians will never forget. This was a transfer of power, peaceful, from one outgoing president to another incoming elected president. And this had never happened before in the history of Egypt. So in 6,000 years of recorded history, we never had this kind of peaceful transfer documented 
so much that the two actors, the outgoing and the incoming president, obviously they realized that this is a unique moment. So they wrote almost a contract, transfer, one transferring power to the other, and both signed it, as if to establish a precedent that hopefully will continue, a peaceful transfer of power. Uh, so that is the day, the moment that I thought I should alert you how unique it was in our contemporary history. And that takes me to the second point that I'd like to share with you. And that is what happened in Egypt, preceded one month in Tunisia, followed one month in Libya, for three months in Bahrain, in Yemen, four or five countries that have popular uprisings against protracted tyrannical leaders who have been in power anywhere from 40 years, 20 to 40 years. These uprisings in several Arab countries together made what some of the foreign reporters turned the Arab Spring. So coining that term is not really credit to the Arabs, but credit to people who were observing the Arab world. And the word spring that was used some 30 years earlier, probably was a Prague Spring, was always associated with uprisings for democracy and freedom. So it is a deserved label for what has been happening in the Arab world, but we also should credit to both Prague and then to the foreign correspondents who were watching and observing and reporting on Egypt and the Middle East. Then I move to my second point, and that is, again, part of our debate with Western colleagues. Following the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc, and why much of the world was rejoicing at that, came some developments that swept many parts of the world, again, for democracy and freedom. You would probably recall the revolution in Portugal in 1974. Then a year later in Spain. Then a month later in Greece. So Southern Europe was the last part of the democratizing Europe. And that was termed at the time the third wave of democracy. All of these waves were supposedly European. And then that third wave spread to Latin America. And then came back from Latin America to the Far East, your part of the world, especially starting with Philippines and the rest of Eastern uh, Asian countries. And then that same wave will go to Sahara, South Africa, Tanzania, Nigeria, other places. And that's where Samuel Huntington came up with a very disturbing article that turned the title on in the book in which he asserted that this third wave, when it comes to Arab Muslim shores, it breaks down. So somehow, he 
contented that there is something in the Arab Muslim religion and culture that defies democratization. As middle aged scholar at the time, Muslim scholars, we took issue with him. But he was far more famous, a Harvard political scientist. His words about Arab Muslim exceptionalism prevailed in the debate for many years to come until the Indonesian uprising against the sword. So he said, oh, see how one thing goes wrong? Here is a Muslim majority country, a big country, 200 million, and they clamored and they rose against the dictatorship of their own for democracy. So he retorted it back. It was an interesting debate. He said, oh, but Indonesia is more, belongs more to East Asia, to the mainstream Islam of the Middle East and the rest. So we waited patiently for another example to break that assertion or that contention of uh, someone of you. Then, you know, it took some years before the Tunisian uprising. And a month later, an exception. And as I said, a month after that, Bahrain, Yemen, Libya, and so on. So why did my wife choose a title for this lecture that Egypt renews the Arab Spring? Because it wasn't all that pleasant. We thought it could be peaceful, but it was not always peaceful. We thought it would win and triumph everywhere, but it did not. It got stuck in two countries at least. One was Libya, and the other even more dramatic, seriously, or sadly, in Syria. So the Arab Spring was stalling, and yet the series of events in Egypt picking up again and having a series of elections and a referendum over a constitution, over a presidency, and a competition that was for the first time free and fair and observed by international organization as well as local civil society. Ibn Khaldun was always in the lead of that as a center I belong to. So in that sense, Egypt seemed to be reasserting not only that the Arab Spring is still underway, but also reasserting its leadership, regional leadership, as a model country in the need for this organization. Then I move on my written remarks to some of the micro details of the Egyptian revolution. And I apologize to Michael because he may have heard that from me twice, dinner last night and sometime this morning. So if I repeat myself, uh, forgive me. What happened in the uh, 21st of March, to, uh, to 21st of January, 2011, roughly one month after the Tunisian uprising that uh, deposed Zain al-Abidin bin Ali, that uprising in Egypt was full of surprises. And I want to share with you some of these because I had my wife as an eyewitness. She actually she was in the square even before everybody else came. Uh, not that we had any advanced information, but just a coincidence that she was in the neighborhood. So she saw the crowds coming, and she 
moved with a seminar that she's organizing to be in the square by the time youngsters cross the bridges to Tahrir Square. All right. I happened to be in the States at the time, teaching in New Jersey. She called me. She was briefing me very gladly. But also I get a call from the White House asking me to come down for consent. Some of my friends were among the advisors of President Obama. So I did uh, fly down to Washington. I found fellow Egyptians milling in demonstration around our house in support of their fellow Egyptians in Tahrir and Kerr. I get in the White House. I found that the national security was meeting. Uh, Joe Biden was presiding at Hillary Clinton. He had uh, the Secretary of Defense, and everybody that you see in movies usually in these meetings. But the question was, what do you make out of the sink? We are concerned, especially after Tunisia, that there's something happening in the region that we should be more educated about. And that's why we called you to come and share your view of this. I said, well, it happened that my wife is in Tahrir Square right now. Let us call her. She can give you even a better briefing than anything else. I called her back. We put the microphone, the telephone, on the loudspeaker so everybody in the room like this could hear. And President Obama would walk in and out every hour or two hours. So it happened that once he, in one of those short uh, intercessions, he heard her from her. So he asked her the three, three questions. Who are these people in the square? Second question about what is the gender mix in that crowd? And the third question was whether they are shouting anti-American slogans or not. So she, for the first question, these are youngsters like the ones who elected you, except they did not collect dollar of each for your first hundred million for your first country. But they are the same profile, middle class kids, mostly university graduates or university students. He was amused when she said, like the people who elected you. He said, well, what about the religious mix? Uh, gender mix. He said, well, you know, it looks to me the crowd that I'm seeing now is about 60% boys and 40% girls. He said, what about the religious mix? I can tell who is Muslim, who is not a Muslim in the crowd, but to the extent that there are some girls wearing crosses, obviously there are Muslims and Christians. As for your third question about shouting anti-American slogans, if you, Mr. President, do not issue a statement of support of this youngsters here in Egypt, I will be the one who will start calling down to America. <laughs> he was amused, probably, and they said, what do you advise us to do? He said, you know, whatever you advise, if you can talk to Mubarak, don't open fire. Because the way that the square is filling every minute, more, you know, thousand person joining that crowd, opening fire would make it a bloodbath. And you, Mr. President, not just America, but you, you will be clean. So what do I have to do that? He said, America is blamed for everything in this part of the world. Uh, so if Mubarak, who has been an ally of the United States for the last 30 years and we're receiving aid every year, you will be implicated. He said, all right, thank you very much. Stay in tune, and we hope that you'll give us more and more reports. Anyway, this was just 
one shot because in a big event like this, I think any eyewitness that we can get hold of, and I hope the center can do that, uh, document just personal testimonies of people who are in the scene uh, somehow. And we just happened by accident that my wife was there, and there was an America and in the White House for the National Security Council. Uh, so we had parts, small parts, to testify to and to see. So we mentioned that because when I went on her command to back to Egypt the following day, and uh, I got there, uh, everybody, of course, was rejoicing at the airlines when we got the news that Mubarak stepped down. And when I got also to the airport, there was still a festive mood among Egyptians at the airport. And they ushered me very quickly uh, without even stamping my uh, passport. And uh, I went to the square with her, looked for leaders of that revolution, for fact. So it was like a leaderless uprising. At that time, I felt a little bit taken. A little taken, or actually taken, because having, you know, taught courses about social movements and revolutions, I knew that revolutions could be high. And I wrote a series of articles in one of our main daily newspapers in Egypt about the hijacking of the revolution. And I identified three potential hijackers. The first was the military as a possible hijack. The term, the term is scarf. That the supreme Military leadership called SCAF, that's abbreviation. And the second potential hijacker of the revolution would have been the Muslim leaders. I wrote that on my second day in Egypt after my wife commanded me to come back. And then the third hijacker would be the potential remnants of the old ruling party, the National Democratic. And unfortunately, even though they, every social scientist liked to say that his prediction came true, I was sad that the first two actually came true. The military ruled for about 15, 16 months. And then when they had the elections, the Muslim brothers gained, and Morsi, one of the prominent leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, became an Egyptian president. And again, by fluke, I happened to know the guy. He was with me in prison, of course. And I knew that he will not be called the shots. Because even in prison, he was number four among the Muslim brothers who were all with me in prison. So in, even in a meeting, luncheon or breakfast or any occasion where prisoners were allowed to socialize, if he happened to be there, he will speak number four. After the three senior Muslim brothers before him. So I felt that this guy would not be his own master. And that the supreme guy of the Muslim brother, whose headquarters is only about 150 meters from my Ibn center, I knew that other people would be called in the shots by a crew. Anyhow, unfortunately, some of, again, my prediction came true. This guy bungled. First of all, he overpromised that in 100 days he was going to solve some of Egypt's chronic problems. And that did not happen. So there was rising concern and unrest 
in his probably four fifth months. And he unfortunately also mismanaged this small crisis. And with every mismanagement, the crisis will get worse. And then the biggest probably bundle was his unilateral action. As a president of the Republic, he issued a decree in November 2001. November 2001. <coughs> Granting himself legislative <coughs> power. We do not have a parliament at the time. So, Beside his own executive power as head of state, he granted himself legislative power, issuing laws. And one of the earliest laws that he issued was a law immunizing him against any questioning or any accountability. Another bundle is that he was reported to have promised Omar al-Bashir, another fellow Muslim brother, but ruling in Sudan, to concede a disputed area on the Red Sea called the Halayb Triangle. It's a very small area, probably. In normal cases, nobody has paid attention. But because everybody was tuned to what this guy is doing after he issued that decree granting himself powers of accountability, uh, the country became very A lot of people became very concerned. And then another rumors, not confirmed, I could not confirm it in the writing, is that he promised Hamas. And that's Palestinian Hamas. To give them a sizable chunk of Sinai to release the pressure. If you know Gaza Strip, it is roughly a square, one square mile, but it has about one million people, two million people, very dense. And the Palestinians have been hoping to get some outlet somewhere. So the, uh, the rumors had that Morsi, who was released from prison by 40, with Hamas's help, Hamas had sent a contingent to Egypt on the fourth or first day of the revolution that managed to break into the prison where he was, not where we were together, but another prison, and to release him. And the rumors had it that in return for this big favor of releasing him from prison, that he promised to give them a big chunk of Sinai to at least spread the population of Gaza. True or not, the rumors sometimes would have the same effect as if they were facts, if people believe them and they act on them. So there was a lot of concern, not only among the Egyptian public at large, but also in the army. So the chief of staff and SCAP, that is the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, that is the abbreviation for SCAP, had series of meetings and they gave him some warnings expressed some concern. And instead of paying attention to this concern by the armed forces, he removed two or three of the top leadership, including you know, Field Marshal Tantawi and many others, and Sami Anand. So the middle and lower ranks of the office of court became really quite concerned. And I think it is because of their pressure 
that whoever took over from Pantau and Anan, who happened to be uh, Mr. Al-Fattah Sisi, uh, and Al-Fattah Sisi was an intelligence guy, so he knew what was going on in the armed forces, and he began to act on it, uh, sent a warning to uh, President the American, the modern brother fellow, uh, but it was not heeded. So he asked the Egyptian people to come out and distribute on June 30th of last year and to delegate to the armed forces the mission of saving Egypt from the specter of the Muslim brother control of the destiny of fellow Egyptians. And some reportedly 30 million Egyptians went out in the streets. And there are all kind of aerial photography from all the major Egyptian cities to document this event. And if it's true that there was 30 million, that would be the biggest demonstration in history. Not in any, we don't know any place where 30 million people came out in the same day, not first in my room. I know you heard that story before. Uh, so anyhow, he took that as a mandate, and he issued an ultimatum to Mr. Morsi, President Morsi, and in due time, when the mandate, when the warning was not heeded, he uh, moved on, removed him from office, and uh, had a meeting in which all the political parties were represented, and they agreed on a roadmap for a pacted transition, a transition that's punctuated by issuing a new constitution, by having a referendum on that constitution, and then a presidential election, and then a parliamentary election. And we had the first and the second part of that pact of transition. We are still waiting for the uh, 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 parliamentary uh, election, which is scheduled in about two months from now. So that is the transition. That is the roadmap. Now, what I wrote in my uh, notes here is how the Muslim Brothers managed to hijack the conclusion, and also how the RB managed to restore it back, which made the uh, army chief of staff, uh, Marshal Sisi, a very pivotal thing. And when he uh, put his name as a candidate for the presidency, he was elected by very, very sizable majority, even though my wife and I did not elect him. but. Uh, he did not need our vote. We they just voted against him to make a point. Uh, but he is very popular, very charismatic, very soft-spoken, by the way, unlike you know, most military. And he's just beginning. This is his first months in power. He did not overpromise. He always asked Egyptians to work with him. He said, I could not do miracles, but with your help, I will be able to at least move the country ahead. He sometimes projected in the popular media as another Nasser and occasionally as another decor. If he's another Nasser, then that's not a good news for him. If it is in the whole like, then there is hope that he may actually help establish democracy. By the way, I think Egypt now has at least renewed the hope. If not completely renewed democracy, at least renewed the hope for democracy. 
under this newly elected president of Texas. I probably should stop here and open the floor for some questions or discussion or comments. But I'd like to express again my gratitude to my friends and Professor Hudson for inviting me. I was here 20 years ago for a brief visit, and now that's my second. But as they say, this country seems to renew itself every five years, not even every 10 years. So I found things quite different from what they were 20 years ago. So I express again my gratitude for the invitation, and I look forward to some stimulating questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, interesting and, uh, I should say, perhaps optimistic account of uh, what has happened in Egypt. Uh, we'll open the floor, as we always do, for your comments uh, and questions. But I will exercise the right of the chair to ask the first one, and uh, it is this. Uh, when we were uh, discussing the subject earlier, uh, you said that uh, you had made three predictions uh, how the uh, revolution or the uprising might be hijacked. Uh, one being it might be hijacked by the military, one being it might be hijacked by the Muslim Brotherhood. But you didn't talk now, but I read about the third one, which was the possibility, you said, that it might be hijacked by the amendments of the rule of the old regime, the NDP, the National Democratic Party, which is, of course, is Mubarak's uh, party, which is, which is now in the band, but of course, they're still hanging out there. And so, obviously, my, my question is, um, if you look at the third hijacking, if that is what is in progress, if your prediction is right, uh, must we then say that uh, the democratic uh, and liberal experiment in Egypt has failed and we've gone back to pretty much where we were? Uh, I wouldn't uh, go that far, but let me say why I made the prediction about the National Democratic Those of you who are familiar with the literature may remember a book written by Leonard Weiner called The Second Strata. Is anyone familiar with it? Second Strata? Well, Weiner was a political scientist at Chicago, then he moved to UCLA. And he came to Egypt in the 50s and 60s. He was a student from the East Court. And I wrote a book called The Second Strut. The thesis in this book is that he reviewed empirically all members of the different Egyptian parties. And he was struck, this was be good for you all this story, right? how certain families, some 400 to 500 families, seem to always bob in every parliament that Egypt had between 1920 to 1950, that's the liberal age, Egypt was still a monarchy. And then, even after Nazir came to power, and then Sadat came to power, and they had parliaments of sorts, same families keep reappearing. And he called that group the second story. They are not at the top, but they are immediately below the top. And he said, you know, these are the notables, those in the countryside, and the cities. I will get the Ayan. The word the Ayan and over here. I am in the countryside, for those of you who know Arabic, and over here in the big cities, people who control commerce and industries. He's found that these families keep reappearing, and he called that the service. And he asserted 
that that also gives gives Egypt its stability in one sense, but also how why things do not change as quickly as the revolutionaries would have loved to see, it, including Nasser. That was frustrating to Nasser as well. That things did not move as smoothly or as quickly as he had wanted to. So, given that thesis by Leo Banner, I say that the NDP, which had inherited the Arab Socialist theory, which inherited the National Union, which inherited the World Party, these were all political parties in the history of Egypt from 1920 to the present time. And these 400 to 500 families all over Egypt, different governments, uh, would always manage to have somebody in power, either in the parliament or in the cabinet, in the top judiciary, or in the president itself. Uh, the governor of Monofilia, those of you who are familiar, <laughs> is one place where the last four prisons came from. From Sadat to Mubarak to Afatah Sisi. The last three prisons are all from Hanafi. And all from this kind of second strap, even though they are. Some came from the military, some came from the military. Anyhow, so that's the NDP, is that we have this forthcoming election. Uh, I predict, or well, this way, that those four or five hundred families that Leo Binder called the second struggle will figure very prominently in the parliament. And in that sense, that would be the third. And curiously enough, CEC seems to have sensed that. So he has been urging Egyptians to pay, to pay attention to the forthcoming parliamentary election and reminding them that the new constitution had slimmed down the presidential power and have transferred them to the parliament. And therefore, he would like to see a parliament that could be at least in tune or cooperative with him. And that's why he is very actively urging Egyptians to uh, get involved and to be engaged in parliamentary elections. That's your question. All right, I think we'll open it up now for uh, uh, general comments and questions. And um, I'll ask you just briefly to uh, identify yourself. Uh, Dr. Matthew Ray, first of all. Matthew Ray, I'm a distinct fellow here. Um, I was wondering about your last conclusion about how uh, CC renewed democracy in Egypt. How do you consider uh, the law against demonstration? And how do you consider putting in jail for 15 years some youth movement just about a couple of weeks ago? And how do you think Sisi will deal with the ongoing uprising in the student uh, universities due to this year? He's doing very bad. Um, all against him for having been doing this, for having been also retarded or reluctant to release people from prison. Uh, as Mike said, you know, I basically come from the human rights tradition. That's the only thing I did publicly. I never held a government job. I was never part of any ruling elite. I was always on the side of the opposition, and especially as a human rights activist. Uh, so my Khadun Center, along with Ten other human rights organizations issued a statement two weeks ago urging him, when he was elected and before he was inaugurated, to start his administration on with a clean slate to release everybody. As a matter of fact, I got in trouble because among the people I suggested he should release, give presidential pardon, which the constitution gives him. The is also to pardon two presidents who are in prison, Hosni Mubarak 
and Mursi. And even my own village turned against me for having such a thing. My own village, my family. Uh, but, you know, I use the argument that the Prophet Muhammad did that when he returned to Mecca victoriously. He issued a pardon for Quraysh, saying, Zabu Fatu Tulaqa, go free. And Nelson Mandela, after 27 years, the longest political prisoner in history, when he was free and he was elected, his first act was reconciliation. Reconciliation was white South African who ruled, who put him in prison, and put thousands of Africans behind bars or killed them. So examples of uh, reconciliation in history, to me, is the way to go. And that's what, you know, I wrote three or four articles addressing uh, Mr. Sisi to start, especially because his first speech after inauguration did not mention human rights once. So if you read El Masri you can get it online, you would see that I noted how, and I said, well, you know, I hope he does not take issue with human rights organization and remove all the uh, reservations on him as returning military rule to Egypt. So your fears are quite justified. I share the fear, and I think we should be tuned and should be alerted to what this fellow is. And this is one of the things that I would like to take the chance. I mentioned them in my written remarks, but I failed to mention them here. One of the greatest achievements of the Egyptian Revolution of 21st of January is that it broke the fear value, fear. From the time that Egypt was united, some 6,000 years ago, was, the ruler, the pharaoh, was made into that, and it was Egyptians who invented the God King idea. And therefore, in the ruler of Egypt, it's always elevated by the Egyptians to be sacred, to be beyond criticism, to be feared, to be respected. However, that long tradition of fear vis-a-vis -vis the authority, central authority, Egypt is a hydraulic society, whoever controls the river can control the whole society. Uh, that fear of authority of the top ruling figure in the country was broken on January 21st. This is. The second thing that happened after that revolution, which again is a great achievement, those of you who know Egypt well, is that now every Egyptian is criticized. And what sense puts You ride with a taxi driver. You go to the vegetable stand. You go to a butcher. You go to a university, your school. Everyone is talking politics. Everyone is asking, where is the country going? This is new, because politics has remained the preview of the top 10-15% of the country, the elite. Now, everybody is talking politics. And the third great achievement is women involvement. Women involvement in politics. In the four or five times that we voted since January 21st, the lines of women they usually have women in one line and men in one line. It was always longer than that of men. So women 
and becoming not only all the Egyptians are involved, but particularly women are very involved. And that gives me hope and reduces some of the apprehensions I expressed earlier. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Up here. Well, I think many of us find it very difficult to understand how one can be optimistic about uh, a military coup which overthrows an elected government. Now, I can also understand that this elected government is doing a whole lot of, I mean, to say the least, rather silly things. Um, but generally speaking, the way to get rid of an elected government is to wait for the next elections and vote it out. And then if that had happened, then, well, I suppose you know, people would have thought, well, this is, this is perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm not sure what the difference is between, between uh, Sisi and somebody like Mubarak. Um, I don't know enough about Egyptian politics, perhaps, but it seems to me that, uh, I mean, you know, it, if, you're look, if one thinks that a savior is going to come from the ranks of the military, this is has not very often happened now, I have to say, over lunch you mentioned to me uh, the example of General de Gaulle. Um, but de Gaulle had, you know, de Gaulle had you know, sort of wazard, shall we say, uh, weight and had a history as the leader of the Free French against the Germans during the war, and a whole, I mean, a sort of story past uh, that this was some real figure of national unity uh, and so forth. Now, um, this, but you may have heard of General Sisi before uh, last year, but I don't think very many people outside of Egypt have. I mean, maybe not here and there, but this is not, I think, a, a, a sort of a, a figure of you know, daring exploits in the Palestinian war like NASA and so on. And also, I think just as the people in Tahrir Square would have been rather presumably quite disappointed when uh, Sisi was, uh, when, when Mubarak, when, sorry, Morsi was elected. They presumably the Tamara movement with all its faults and so forth was pretty disappointed when Sisi turned up. And it seems to me that uh, what, what I find very tragic about all this is that this you know, what I think is called in the trade by political scientists, persistent authoritarianism just does not seem to go away. And, uh, I mean, I think I'm right in saying that Naguib and Nasser in their day thought, let us clean everything up and go back to the barracks. I believe that's what they had in mind. And just as they found it, possible to do that. I have a funny feeling that Sisi and his colleagues will find it impossible to do it either. Right. Uh, I think all your points are well taken. But let me just uh, add two or three things that I know which were probably implicit. When I talk about the uh, fear barrier, which has broken, we had two occasions in which, after the revolution and after the fall of, uh, of Morsi, well, from Mubarak and then the fall of Morsi, that Egyptians were not changed a ruler singularly in 6,000 years. Rulers were changed in Egypt, not known by Egyptians, but by some outside power. In three years, they changed two prisoners. That is not to be taken lightly. And Sisi himself, in his nomination speech, when he finally decided to run, he addressed his followers. 
He said, you have promised, pressured me to run. And probably in six months from now, you will be demonstrating at least if I did not live up to his expectation. So he is aware of that as well, that something has happened to Egyptians, that they are not going to submit to an authority just because he is the Muslim. Curiously enough, a movement that emerged a year ago, I don't know if you heard about it. It's called Tamar. Yes. Have you heard of Tamar? Yes, I said it. Yes, this was a right in campaign. So, because the Constitution did not allow for a, a close recall clause of somebody in power, they compensated that by having a nationwide, this was again a youth movement called the Marmot Rebellion, where people were asking for an early election. And they gathered some 26 million. And the challenge for them is to have this written ballots certified everywhere so nobody can claim that this is a fake. And since Morsi was elected by 13 million votes against his competitor at the time, Ahmad Shafiq, who got 12, they wanted to make sure that they will collect at least twice as many votes or many requests, not calling for his de deposing, but calling for an early election. He refused. And his refusal was part of what created the army, of Gaza army, to move against him. And that's why the army also called, of taxis, called for Egyptians to come out. So not only 26, as Kifaya, gathered in writing, but 30 million gathered in their respective cities, all demanding or asking for uh, mercy to depart. Erha. The Marlon's slogan was Erha, Erha. Step down, step down. Uh, is that a guarantee? No, of course nothing is guaranteed. But the human rights community, civil society forces, young people, activists, they are all, you know, of course, on the uh, alert for precisely for the kind of things that you're expressing. And uh, the, uh, the new thing is that the country now has opened uh, to human rights organizations. There was a time when there was a freeze on the activities <coughs> of international human rights organizations in Egypt. As a matter of fact, some of the people that were working with them in Cairo were also put in detention. But now, with the new elections, they, every amnesty was invited, uh, Human Rights Watch was invited, uh, Westminster was invited, uh, rights and democracy in Canada, all of these organizations were invited to come to Egypt and to monitor and observe the election. So there is this uh, added element that not exist. Again, that's no guarantee that things will go the way I wish them to go. And therefore, we are on the left. Uh, can I just add something? I, I think what I find, what I find also bothering, let's say, is how could it be demonization of the one of these um, Because uh, it, it's not as if this is some tiny little political faction, uh, you, you know, which has no support. I 
actually, I mean, a lot of decent, ordinary people support the Muslim brethren who are really, it's, it doesn't really help to make them the devil incarnate uh, because, uh, you know, they have done, I mean, many good things in the past uh, in, in terms of you know, social uh, welfare activity and so on. And uh, they do have a certain amount of support. Now, that they behave very badly in office and that they talk about foolish and so on. I mean, well, yes, of course, but uh, uh, I mean, condemning 500 people to death is a bit much. Well, I mean, I'm sure you agree. Huh? Oh, yes. No, no. This, luckily, that truly was the primary stage of tradition. So the whole thing is appealed, and the appeal is accepted, so they're standing in the trial. Uh, but that as it may be, uh, the Muslim brothers have alienated other than the regime, it's not demonized by the regime. They have alienated big chunks of the cops, women, for example. And why is women more important now? Because under Mubarak, his wife, Suzanne Mubarak, who was a feminist of sorts, AUC graduate, worked very hard to introduce new clothes in the Constitution to allow women a minimum quota of 60 seats in the court. 60 seats. Out of some 400 seats. Not all of us, but at least two women from every government and 10 from Canada. So making up something like 60. When the Muslim Brothers came to power under Morsi, one of the first things they did was to modify them. Not women. And to just put something very vague, like appropriate representation will be observed. But no stipulation on numbers, and therefore that could be, you know. So that is why women actually became uh, very uh, engaged in this uh, But as I said, that is no guarantee that things will go as you and I hope them to go. The other thing that is important to note is that <coughs> marginal border areas, which also were long neglected, like Sinai, Nubia and the South, and Marsama Trost trip all the way to the Nicaragua, and the oasis most of it. The population in these areas have become just like them, very involved, very outspoken about the long deprivation of their respective constituencies, and in fact managed to get certain stipulations in the Constitution to make up for this long historical marginalization, marginalization and deprivation. So we have new groups that are emerging, uh, new constituencies that were silent before, and uh, every day we hear about something. So the situation is very fluid, very dangerous. Yes, please. Okay, question. Uh, the first one is about the title. Why do you use the term Arab Spring? And, uh, some people say that it is a bit uh, loaded with a term. Why not the uh, Arab Spring? I'm sorry if I have explained the idea. Uh, no, 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 no. As I said, it was not me 
It was actually Western observers liking what happened in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Bahrain, Yemen, and Syria. All of these countries, they had uprisings. So they began to talk about this as the Arab Spring. Uh, if you are familiar with Egypt and the weather in Egypt, in the midst of the spring, there is about two weeks called Khamasim. Are you familiar with Khamasim? In which hot, dusty, sandy winds blow the whole country. It's a nightmare for high schoolers because they clean every two hours, and as soon as they clean, two hours later, everything is dusty. So for two weeks, they're working day and night to clear the dust. This is called Khamasi, very nasty period of time. So I say, even if, this, if we accept the metaphor that this is our spring, yet in the midst of that spring, you have a Khamasi. Like what you have a uh, setback in Libya. You have uh, occasional setback in Bahrain where the uprisings were squashed with the help of the Saudis. But on balance, even the monarchs in the Arab world have taken note that they cannot continue to rule as usual. So for one thing, they try to bribe their way out of the Arab Spring. How? I don't know. You all heard about this one. But starting with Kuwait, they gave every adult in Kuwait one month's salary. Just a month. Not to be outdone. The Qataris gave a whole year seven, not just one month. And tell the stage, so the Saudis emulated the Qataris. That, so here are, <laughs> and promises from King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, who is fairly enlightened compared to his predecessors, promised along with the bonus that reforms, and especially for women, participation would be forthcoming. And anyone who's following the affairs of Saudi Arabia would hear you know, report, very positive reports from Saudi former dissidents and from Saudi women. All right. Third thing that seemed to have happened is that the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, in a display of solidarity because the Gulf Cooperation Council are from all monarchical countries. So all six countries of the GCC are monarchies. But they felt concerned over two other monarchs that are not in the Gulf. Who are the two other monarchs? Jordan and Morocco. So they enjoy, they invite Jordan and Morocco to be members of the GCC, even though they are not in the Gulf, that far away from the Gulf. It's interesting, something is happening everywhere, either in monarchical regimes, or like you know, the ones I mentioned, or in the rest of the Arab world. And then you have this ongoing battle in Syria between the opposition and the Assad regime. So these things are continuing. And uh, the net result has to be positive, even though it may not be as positive as you and I wish. But it will be positive. It will not be a zero sum. Yes, please. My second question is about uh, 
what is recently a coup by the military? Here is been accepted by Egyptians. Uh, maybe you can explain why it is open by the Arab world. Mm. And how long do you think the, the CC uh, regime could last? Well, first of all, uh, Egyptians don't call it a coup. Only the Muslim brothers. Also, some Western quarters with it. We have, in Egypt, call it the revolution of the 30th of June. And therefore, you have the revolution of January 21st and the revolution, the restoration revolution of June 30th. So, it is all in the eyes of the people. For the concerned stakeholders, the fellow Egyptians, the majority do no, no longer consider it a coup. Uh, because the Marron, which collected signature before June 30th, they collected 26 million signatures and pleaded with Morsi not to step down, but to just have an early presidential election. Had he positively responded, he may have saved himself and saved the country a great deal of upheavals, but he did not. Because the Muslim brothers had their own world view. They wanted a country that would become a base from which to start a global uh, attempt to restore the caliphate thinking or at least assuming in the literature that under the caliphate the Muslims will not only be prosperous and strong but they'll be able to dominate us. That is a their doctrine in writing, it's not allegation. And they're very proud of it. And that's how they recruit young, because they give them that dream. The big dream of power and prosperity, strength and prosperity, and justice. So these kind of slogans have enabled them to survive for that long, despite, you know, uh, several attempts to acquire them by different regimes. And I agree with you, I think they should not be demonized, and they did say that this, every attempt to take away the Muslim brothers in the past failed. And therefore, CC or any of his colleagues will not be more successful than Nasser, for example. So Nasser's question put many of them in prison, but that did not mean they disappeared. They remained underground, and they will continue to exist. The question is to face them with an alternative program, a world vision, an alternative uh, ideology. That is a way to do battle with them. And in fact, for a long time, I even alienated Mubarak when I defended them. And they said, you know, they have a chance to evolve as Muslim Democrats, just like their counterpart in Europe, who you have Christian Democrats. I said, and why not? I mean, there are Muslims who really believe in democracy, along with Islam. So the two are not going to be contradictory. So there are give and take on that. There is a debate still going on both in Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria. And uh, there is an interesting wake awakening after the recent development in Iraq with this very fanatic group that seems to be gaining ground in Iraq. And both, in Libya there is something similar, and both of them have called on Egypt to step in to help control the situation, stabilize the situation, respect it. 
So what I'm saying is that it is too early to make final uh, verdict on what's happening. But we have to watch it and watch it with due concern. I just want to come back and the time of the movement. As I remember when there were three people who were initiated the movement, and one of the three people is actually in prison from Sisi. So it's very strange to be in power by a movement who called for uh, strong democratic, as you qualified it, and then to understand the elections from our nomination of somebody at the presidency from yeah. the same movement who put in jail the people who asked him to come to power. Right. And the other comment is like on Bahrain, you say that the movement is cured by Arabi Saudi, Saudi Arabia. And on Egypt, you just have a very strong support from Saudi Arabia since Sisi is in power. So it seems very strange for me. I mean, I don't clearly understand the lines where democratic paths going on. No, no, I think what you really had expected to see is to see a neat blueprint. I'm saying the situation has a lot of trouble. It's confused, as I mentioned in Hamasin, that stormy, dusty wind. It's not all spring pleasantly, mild, beautiful, no. And when you look at back at the revolutions, I mean, how long did it take the French to settle them? It took 18 years before France in Iran. It took 10 years. Revolutions do not change things overnight. Yes, revolutionaries will have their honeymoon when they're fighting against the old regime. And they did in Tahrir for three weeks. And their demands were very modest in the beginning, just to reform. But by the second week, as the number grew, they escalated their demands. Instead of reform, they wanted to remove the cabinet. And by the third week, when their demands were not heeded, they began to call for regime change. A Shah Buri that we hear in Uzam. They want a big transformation. Now, when the emergency law was passed under SCAP, the first day that the law went into effect, this young revolutionaries broke. The law basically does not prevent demonstration, but they ask to get a permit to demonstrate at least 12 hours before the demonstration, and to specify the area where you will have the demonstration. These two clauses did not agree with any reference. So, in an act of civil disobedience, they broke the law immediately. So the state had no choice if to accept it, but to arrest them and, and try them. Now, of course, the whole human rights community is up in arms because of that. But that is basically what happened. Now, I happen to know this young fellow who defied in the poker, and he had gone to prison before. He and his father, in fact, before him, his father, my generation. So he comes from a family of discipline, defined people. But we also teach our students is that different civil disobedience, as we learned it from Gandhi and from Martin Luther King, is that yes, we defy the law, but we would be willing or ready to accept the penalty, just to make a point, as I did. And therefore, yes, we continue to rally for either modifying the law 
or for getting a presidential pardon until a legislator comes into power and re-issue the law about the administration. So it is a struggle. It is a struggle. And we'll continue to carry that struggle. Uh, question about <coughs> the title uh, of, of your talk, Egypt Renews the Arab Spring. And uh, first of all, uh, it seems to imply uh, that in Egypt itself, uh, the Arab Spring, the uprising, is the movement for democracy and freedom has been uh, restored uh, in, a, in a positive way. Clearly, as I think you can tell from some of the comments, that's a, that's a debatable position. Mm -hmm. uh, people can have different opinions about it. And I must say, uh, in a, a new regime whose security forces uh, kill 900 people in one afternoon and arrest thousands, uh, it doesn't sound to me like it's moving that way. But that's, that's not really the point of my question. Because uh, I thought it, it implied that Egypt, in its new direction, whatever it is, uh, is going to positively influence the other countries of the Arab Spring. But um, I guess I'm wondering how that exactly works. Uh, and Matthew's point touches on this a little bit. Because it, it seems that uh, after uh, Sisi uh, and the military took power and so forth, uh, the other Arab countries that were happiest were the ones that are the least democratic and the most autocratic. And you mentioned some of them, the states of the Gulf in particular. So one might have thought that, well, if, if this is the kind of example that the, the Egypt is, is projecting to the rest of the world, to the rest of the Arab world, it's, it's not going in the direction that the uprisings presumably were uh, trying to move them toward. And as for the countries that have had these very messy uprisings, as, as you well, well described, uh, I'm wondering what exactly the mechanism is for Egypt to exert positive influence in a democratic direction in places like Libya, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain, and so on. Well, a possible alternative title is that Egypt, instead of renewing Arab Spring, is burying the Arab Spring. I would give you the written text, and if your remark still the same. And if you convince me of the need it, that there is no spring coming, or Egypt is not doing it, we'll change the title to Egypt Bering. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the new argument is suffocating the region. But being on the sea, and I'm no friend of the military. If anything, you know, I suffered a lot under three successive rulers. I ended up in prison uh, and in exile for quite a while. So it, is, it does not please me to see somebody of a military background sending to war. But to me, it is a means of getting to power, a means of teaching power. And that's why in our informal conversation, I said, CC is likely to be like Bigo, than to be like Saddam. And I have some partial evidence of that. One is the way he addressed Egyptian people. Uh, two, that he appeals, he does not command. Three, he, I haven't met him personally. Yeah. But he seemed to read my criticism or my messages to him from the newspaper, it's always open letters so people can share 
my hopes and intentions. And he will send me one of his top advisors to either take issue or to ask me for more uh, advice or information. If he does that much, and I don't know, I assume that he is doing it with other intellectuals or other critics, uh, it at least gives me some hope that uh, he is more likely to be like a new uh, And as I said, I still stand for uh, any, after you read the written text and my argument, and after I elaborated, it could be one of your publications. If you still share the, the strong connection, I will change the fact. Okay, um, we're probably a little over time, but I'm going to take questions as long as they come. Yes, please. Oh, somebody from the same. Thank you very yes. much, Brock. Thank you yes. very much. If you don't mind, it's my duty to gun respect. Now, the question is that when, exactly as Prof. Uh, <coughs> Michael had just said, that when we look up to the term reference and other different, I think that the question when you talk about the spring terminology, the context of the Arab world, Everyone will expect it is Arab shortcoming. It's not Arab Spring at all. Right from day one, because the Arab will never re rectify the shortcoming. So we just, just in correlation with your, your uh, assertion uh, that you mentioned that the regime is bribery the citizens in terms of rewarding them, the unthinkability in, in a good, proper management. The question that you say here, my humble curiosity to say here, don't you like Arab, most Arab I see in the world, don't you have pride, don't you have dignity, don't you have spiritual definition that what is wrong should not be in the order of the day. And yet, there seems to be no, not even one clergy, not even one leadership to say that, look, and not even intellectual like you and the others say, look, this is, this is totally rejectable. Because it looks to me, there seems to be no end with irregularity. So what happened with the Arab pride and the Arab dignity? So I do want to say that we're going to talk about the Arab problem. It's not worth looking at. Because I come here to a due respect for you, but not in terms of reference. Almost I feel rejected at first sight. So the question is that, what happened? Because it reflects very bad on the religion. Very, very bad. And I say, they shouldn't pray five times a day. Forget about it, because they don't why. It's just that they have no principle. Because that, the dignity that you know, we are supposed to uphold. And here we're talking about every day is a live show, talk show, and things like that. What happened with it in town? Put aside the clergy aside, because it's clergy to live in your own world. But the question people like you, who will look at where is the stand of that? So what what you what you know, your take on that? Because I don't see the future. Well, as I said, you know, these are legitimate concerns. And you will use the word dignity. The slogans of the youngsters in Tahrir Square talk about Aish, the spread, freedom, for real. Karama, which is dignity, and social justice. As that. These are the four slogans of the Egyptian So dignity right there at the second. Now we know the revolution can issue all kinds of slogans. And that's why I mentioned the French Revolution. Despite all the three very appealing, colorful words, but it took them 18 years to begin to move the country. Some of them. So I'm uh, not as naive as to think that just issuing a slogan will get things changed by themselves. And that's why I talked about women involvement, talked about marginal areas. 
that had never been part of the mainstream are now coming into the mainstream. Talked about youngsters. All of these forces, of course, are into the omelet making of post-revolutionary breaking a lot of eggs to make an omelet. That's one of the same. I think it was church or something. He said you have to break a lot of eggs. In, in a revolution you have to make a lot of eggs. Uh, dignity is without bread. There's no dignity. Without proper housing, there's no dignity. Without, you know, education. So you have, you know, basic needs that have to be addressed. And before you can really talk about dignity in, in real sense. And uh, the Arabs, like anybody else in the world, and that's why I quoted in the beginning, hunting the land, I took issue with him. Because he made an assertion, not too much different from yours, is that the Arabs or the Muslims are not fit for the Muslims. And here in the written text, I counted the countries that in fact had gone through a democratic, Muslim, Muslim majority can that went through democratic trans, uh, transformation. And they added up to about four fifths of the Muslim world. Uh, three quarters, I'm sorry, three quarters. But there was an empty quarter, and the empty quarter was the Arab world, when I took issues with it. But that empty quarter began to fill up with Tunisia, then Egypt, then Libya, then Bahrain, then Yemen, and now currently Syria is battling to be part of that, to fill that empty quarter. So it's not going to be a clean cut transition. There will be a lot of muddy, bloody uh, moments in that evolution. And as social scientists, we know that change does not happen neatly and as if you are in a laboratory which you're experimenting. No. In real life, it is a very messy affair. Hi, I'm what I feel like here at the Institute. Um, thank you for a very personal account of the uprising. Um, in the early days, there was so much euphoria and optimism you know, about what was going on and hope for the future. But it's always seemed to me that uh, a turning point was the day that Saudi Arabia crossed the causeway into Bahrain and just brutally crushed the uprising. And at that time, things changed. But at the same time, it seems uncanny that what happened in this tiny island nation profoundly affected large currents in Egypt and the Arab world. So how much importance do you attach to the Saudi invasion of Bahrain in initiating a you know, so-called counter-revolution and this very messy struggle back and forth between the people and entrenched elites? Very good question, and it's very agonizing. And here is where things get a bit messy in the Arab debate over the year. One is that the royal family in Bahrain, which is a Sunni ruling over the countries <coughs> whose majority are Shia. So any disturbance, any dissent or protest against the ruling family of Al Khalifa in Bahrain is attributed to the Shia population and to the Iranians across the Gulf, across the water. And what I do not believe that myself, and I've taken issue in writing, for many 
in the Gulf area in Saudi Arabia and brought the sun outside the Gulf. They swallowed this argument and there is a constructed fear of the Shia march in the Arab world. And uh, I think it was King of Hussein and Mubarak who talked about the Shia triangle that was in the making was Iran, Bahrain, and southern Iraq, and the Shia triangle in the threat to the Arab world. So I took issue. And this was one of the reasons why I went to prison publicly, that the guy is ignorant, that he doesn't know much about the history of this three or four countries. And that whatever demands are made of Al Khalifa are legitimate demands. It happened that the Shia are the most oppressed in both in Bahrain and in eastern Saudi Arabia and in southern Iraq, they were at the time. And uh, just because they were the most oppressed, not because they were Shia, that they were against the regime. That message is part of the debate. But our voices are not always the loudest when we made that kind of assertion. But talk about that, I mean, it is part of the debate and should continue to be part of the debate. I have a, a question about, um, and I think you just alluded to it, about uh, the uh, economic basis of the Arab uprisings, and especially in Egypt. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, there was a series of labor strikes in Egypt for some years, actually, and certainly some months before the actual uprising occurred, and that there have been, I think, there's been labor unrest since. Uh, economists uh, say that you know, Egypt's economic conditions and the condition of its infrastructure and so forth and so on uh, is pretty dismal. And uh, I, th I think if, if one, if you were to try to look at the situation from, say, a class perspective, um, do you see uh, a significant threat to the longevity of the CC uh, presidency uh, because of the unlikelihood that tangible economic benefits will be available to the Egyptians in the near future. Oh, I see that as a real uh, possibility of threat. And that's why he did two things very early on. One is to meet with Egyptian businessmen, both inside the country and outside, invited them, to ask them collectively to raise 100 billion dollars. Whether they would be able to do that or not, but he asked them to raise hundred billion dollars that he needs reinvested in Egypt. He's not asking them to pay it as a tax or as a tribute or anything. He just asked him to come back and invest in the country. And he marked the areas of investment and what needs to be done. Apparently his economic team has worked. But the second thing, which is, seemed to be underway, is that he appealed to Arab neighbors, mainly the Emiratis, the United Arab Emirates, the Saudis, and the Kuwaitis, to convene a donor's conference, friends of Egypt, and King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia is taking the lead on that. He is hoping that loans or grants from 
these friends of Egypt would be in the neighborhood of $50 billion. So he's asking uh, well to do Egyptians, many of whom are already I'm afraid of the money and all, and fellow wealthy Arab countries to step in and to him. Should they respond and should that happen, he will have a lease on life for at least a year or two. He had asked the Egyptians to give him two years, grace period, before they see complete results. The guy is an intelligent guy. He was the head of the military intelligence. In many ways, he has the same profile as uh, Vladimir Putin, good or bad. And in fact, one of his early visits were to Russia. So he's appealing to everybody, both in the Arab world, in Europe, in Russia. Uh, and curiously, he has not talked about America at all. But American aid is continuing, at least the military part. So these are all inputs into the next year or two. And those of you and you are one who know much about Egypt and Egypt society, both Egyptians are fairly patient people. And, and I think if they see at least some partial signs that things are improving, even if it's not up to what they all wish for, but just some improvement, I think the Egyptian people will be patient enough to wait and see. If they were patient, because Mubarak for 30 years, I think, probably was patient with Sisi for two years. Okay, if there are no more questions or comments, I would like to thank our distinguished lecturer and commentator very much for his stimulating presentation and for the exchange uh, that has followed. Uh, we're very much indebted to you for that. And uh, as a small token of our esteem, uh, we in Singapore like to give you a little souvenir. Oh, okay. it's a souvenir. Oh. This is the fur lion. The fur lion is a strange beast, part fish and part lion. Yes. Uh, it spouts water out of its mouth. And, um, and, uh, so it can use that for whatever purpose. Yes. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.